And Mrs. Marcos did it, her way. But the people can't afford the houses she's built. That's something the commentator of the government television channel won't tell you. Stand by studio, please. And here we have gathered uh, the residents from the Tatalon area. You will recall that about a year ago, this area was awarded to them by the president. And today we have the housing units already established by the National Housing Authority and the Ministry of Human Settlements. Um, as the names of 10 representatives are being called on stage to receive from Mrs. Marcos the title of the land, about a year ago when President Marcos visited this area, the people were practically in tears. And they couldn't believe the fact that uh, after having stayed here for so long, they would, in effect, finally own the piece of land where they have squatted over the past so many years. This is a song by the school children residing here at the Tatalon Estate, expressing their gratitude to the First Lady and the other officials of the National Housing Authority and the Ministry of Human Settlements, speaking about the new tomorrow that they face and the gratitude that they feel for the government's concern for them, together with the school buildings that have been constructed. The children were taught to sing that song for today image building again and again all good things are shown to come from above not as a result of the efforts of the people and behind the fronts newly painted for the occasion the buildings are still improvised shacks many development projects are like this all show no substance yet the people pay who is fooling whom This is the reality which official television never showed. People forced to live in sewage pipes. They live in these pipes not because they want to but because they have to. There just isn't anywhere else for them to go. They have been forced into this place and into other slums because there is no work for them in the countryside. And when they come to the cities, there is often still no work and no housing that they can afford. One third of the people in Manila live in slums like these, without clean water or sanitation. No wonder dysentery is the fourth cause of death in the country. This gentleman has been living in this tube since August of this year. He was relocated uh, about April of this year to a rather far off place, about uh, a little about 60, 70 kilometers from Manila. But he has no job there. So he has to come back here because otherwise he couldn't feed his family. Here, he does sell fried bananas. He has organized a small cooperative here of different uh, people who live in the area and they've, uh, they're, they fry bananas and that's what they make a living from. You can get an idea from this about how much malnutrition, how much hunger, how much disease there is in this area. <laughs> But even here, human dignity cannot be completely stifled. And I think that uh, from here, uh, I'll take you down to one of the clinics which has been set up by the people themselves. And this is just one of the many examples of what people are doing in an effort to assert that they are people. This simple clinic in someone's front room looks after more children in a year than ever get to see the fantasy of the children's hospital on the other side of town. This is what we should have more of, preventative care. One doctor, Mita Pardo de Tavera, has helped volunteer health workers and mothers run their own clinic. 
This child is three years old, but she has the weight of a one-year-old child. We can consider her as a third-degree uh, malnutrition, which uh, is more or less uh, the picture of children in the country today, where, where 80 percent of children below five years of age are malnourished, and five percent are third degree malnutrition. Actually what we need uh, are uh, services that reach people when you consider that two-thirds of children are born at home and that the country is made up of 7,000 islands. Not everybody can come to Manila where all the uh, uh, tertiary health care hospitals are found. But out in the rural areas there's practically nothing. Now it is true that we have uh, magnificent hospitals like the Heart Center, but that has absorbed a great portion, more, more than 50% of the, of the money for health. 72% um, of Filipinos, or 7 out of 10, have never even seen a doctor. Enterval fights stress by releasing energy, fights stress by increasing body resistance. Enterval. Why should human beings accept conditions like these? Why isn't there more protest? Because as soon as people do protest, they are called subversive, and the army or the paramilitary move in and start arresting them and sometimes killing them. We have a huge army, nearly 300,000 strong. Ten years ago, they were only 60,000. Then, President Marcos declared martial law, and the army grew and grew. Since we don't have any foreign enemies, the army is used to control us. Ironic, isn't it? Legitimate social protest has become a crime. Intimidation, often brutal, follows. Some fishermen and their families lost their livelihood and their homes when they were moved to allow a Japanese company to build a fish processing plant. The people objected. A Protestant deaconess, Sister Miling, led them. She was arrested as a subversive. It was January 27, uh, 15, when we had a big convention in St. James uh, Academy here in Malabon. And 27, I was picked up already. I was only in paid, invited. They say it's only a confrontation. But I didn't really realize that's, that's the time. And what happened? Well, as they accused me as um, subversive, an enemy of my own country. I don't know. <laughs> what did they mean by subversive? I don't know about that. Did they call you a communist? They say that I'm fighting against the government. But God knows I'm not doing it. I'm just helping the people just to be a good Christian. I thought in that time... <laughs> We have a peaceful life in this country. We have a freedom to speak what we want. <laughs> so in after three days, my uncle had visited me in the prison club. And he died when he see me in this situation where I was kept with black spots and over my body. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been formally charged? No, no, it's until now. How long did they keep you? I was kept in the criminal cell together with a carnapper, kidnapper, killer, holdappers. I was kept there almost a six months, six months. And nobody could always help me in my worries. This is where Sister Miling was kept, right in the heart of Manila. The police who held and tortured her, and many others like her, are part of the military. If you have freedom, I tell you, you not be put in prison just talking for your rights. 
if there is freedom, if there is no political detainee in his own country, that's why I tell you that you cannot sing the song which you want to sing. I don't want to hurt anybody, but the only thing is I could see the human rights. Don't it's not here in my country. If you had no rights anymore, maybe it's better to die. I told the president to define what subversion means because his definition is not really correct. I said, your definition is that when we say something against you, we are already subversive. When in fact, we are helping you. There can be no real democracy when there is no opposition. And there is no opposition because we've had martial law for eight years. It was lifted last year in name, but continues in fact. Before that, we had had 70 years of democracy, but martial law destroyed all our democratic institutions. So people have no way of saying what they feel and what they want. Four times last year, the military fired upon a crowd of marchers protesting high prices and uh, military abuses, killing scores of people. So, people have had to develop new ways of fighting for their rights. Protest has gone underground. Hidden presses put out news that newspapers don't want to print or don't dare to. The Communist Party conducts seminars in the slums. As it is all underground, moderates like me can't get into the debate. Government repression is increasingly polarizing discussion. You are either for Marcos and his government, or you are for the extreme left. Uh, in countries like the Philippines, uh, we can maintain the balance between authority and individual rights uh, without um, in any manner losing the concept of the Western Thai style democracy as known by Locke or Jefferson and others, uh, Montesquieu and the rest of them, uh, provided that, uh, however, the emergency powers are exercised properly. I was arrested when martial law was declared and, and, and was kept for about almost two years under detention without charges, without even being interrogated. I was arrested and uh, told simply that, well, uh, they suspected me of being uh, wittingly or unwittingly a member of a conspiracy to overthrow the government, which is, of course, which was very, very silly. In any case, during my two years of detention, and especially during the one month that I spent in total solitary confinement, uh, I came to realize that if I didn't know why I had been detained, if I didn't know what were the rules governing the detention, because they, they were never told to me, if I could be detained this way without trial and without charges, what about all the other people? You know, there were about more than 70,000 people who have undergone the same experience as I have, and even worse. It was at that time that I decided that if I should ever get out, then I would see what I could do to help the people, and particularly those who were under detention. So when I did get out, I helped found a small group which we called the Free Legal Assistance Group with a very uh, appealing acronym, FLAG. And we started out simply by trying to represent political prisoners. But as we went along, we realized we couldn't stop there. We realized that a lot of people who were, had absolutely no political ideology to speak of, but who were simply fighting for their rights as human beings, little farmers, squatters, students, workers, they were all being detained simply because they were standing up for their rights. And something had to be done about this. We began to organize a kind of barefoot lawyer scheme 
using law students and community leaders to teach the poor their 